Hey, hey, it is Dot NYC back in uh, yet another uh, rendition here as we try to figure out how to do Instructables, the This Now Show. Uh, we want to see how we can maybe bring some instruction to this effort uh, out of the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism, because we are, after all, a school. So here's a new effort to instruct in uh, all kinds of things. Today we have our friend from Civic Hall, Peter Shanley. Uh, Peter's in charge of partnerships and strategy there. He's been on startups all over and has taught courses all over. And today he's going to teach a course in customer development to you and to us at Dot NYC. So Peter, over to you. Thank you Thank so you. much. Have fun. So we're going to learn some things today. Um, I'm going to learn um, how to repurpose an old lecture into a new format. And so feel free to uh, ask questions and interrupt me. Uh, we're going to move pretty fast as this is designed to be a much longer session. Um, but we are going to make lemonade out of lemons um, and do uh, just enough to get through this scope. So at the end of the day, what is customer development? Customer development is a structured way to talk to humans. Uh, a friend and colleague of mine, Gift Constable, uh, wrote something, talkingtohumans.com. Uh, you can download a free PDF to kind of walk through some of this stuff. But at the end of the day, all these are, are structured conversations with other human beings, which is kind of terrifying until you kind of learn some best practices and actually practice it yourself. So what we're going to talk about today is the realities of being human, which is why customer development is important. We're going to go through a whirlwind tour of popular frameworks today uh, because that gives you a bit of a high-level context on why customer development as a strategy for probing uncertain uh, markets, business ideas is important. We're going to talk about who on your team uh, should participate. We're actually going to get into a little bit of a working demo practicing this approach to research. And then I'm going to give you a mission to go out and bring this into uh, any of the projects that you're working on. So I kind of threw a bit of a teaser out there. It's actually about listening to humans more so than talking to humans. Um, and why do we need to listen to humans? We need to listen to humans because um, people make decisions. And they're not always rational. Um, a colleague of mine, David Bland, had this fantastic tweet several years ago that's made the rounds. No one uses our product. Ask customers what features are missing. Build the missing features they told you. Rinse and repeat. No one uses the product. He calls this the product death cycle. Um, why is this important? So there's a famous quote from Henry Ford. Even though he never said it, it's quite useful. It's a bit of a parable like that. If I'd only asked people what they wanted, I would have built faster horses. Because horses are what people knew at the time. They didn't know about automobiles. But if you actually listen to humans as they talk to you about their daily lives and what pains and, and kind of problems they face, you might have heard that I need to get from point A to point B faster. Uh, you might have heard that sometimes I'm carrying something and I still need to get someplace. So having a place to put my stuff is important. And maybe something about dung and horse poop in the streets being a pain point. So if you actually ask them what they wanted, they might have said a horse that doesn't poop, that has some storage capability and doesn't get tired and goes fast. But if you actually listen to the root cause of what they're saying, you can get to real pain points. And that is really the basis of good decision making uh, in business. In terms of some of the frameworks that help us conceptualize why talking to humans and listening to humans is important, um, design thinking is front and center. Design thinking is all about empathy, about understanding human-centered design and kind of how value is exchanged potentially through your product, service, or program. People, uh, you know, as Daniel Kahneman in Thinking Fast and Slow taught us, there's uh, an elephant and a rider. And each of us may think we're in control of our own destinies. But there are conscious and subconscious biases that really skew how we make decisions. Um, and that's kind of essential um, to kind of think about as you're probing and trying to learn where the risks are in your entrepreneurial endeavor. Anchored on this is that problems are more important than solutions. Um, pain is real. We've all heard the vitamins and the painkiller, you know, in terms of what type of problem you're solving. Is this something that's acute and here and now and you will move hell or high water to take care of? Or is this a nice to have thing? It's much harder to build a business on nice to have. Um, but at the end of the day, problems are much more important than solutions. Um, there's the kind of old adage, which is that I do not want to drill. I want a three quarter inch hole in the wall. And a drill happens to be a solution, but if you had a, a sticker that had an acid on it that I put onto the wall that made a perfect hole in the wall so I could hang my picture, I'd prefer that because this, you know, the, the drill takes up space in my shelf. 
But at the end of the day, the anchor here is that problems are more important than your solution. And so as you talk to people, you need to be acutely listening to the problems behind what solutions they say they use or would use or might want to use. Um, exchanging is much better than coercion. People today have a lot of choice. The barrier to entry for new startups to be created has been lowered. And so there are kind of an infinite array of things that people can spend their time and money on, right? Madison Avenue long, no longer controls where people make their purchasing decisions. People really have an exchange of value much more so than coercion. At the end of the day, people are human. Uh, they are going to tell you things from their own frame of mind. They may tell you things they think you want to hear. They may tell you things that they themselves aren't even aware of the biases behind it. And so kind of taking a more strategic, scientific approach to qualitative research allows you to cut through some of this noise and get towards truth. At the end of the day, sustainable impact rests upon building a business. Um, you don't want to be at the mercy of someone you know, giving you a grant for your nonprofit if that's the route you want to go. You want to be able to actually think holistically about what this thing in your gut is, right? So entrepreneurship has traditionally been a hunch-driven business, and customer development is a way to kind of bring some scientific rigor um, to that approach. And so actually having hypotheses, I believe that giving this to this person will result in this demonstrable action, something that you can actually measure to know if you're on the right track. Now, it is not the case that you, know, you can split test your way to success. There is still art mixed up in entrepreneurship, but actually putting a bit of rigor for yourself to keep yourself and your team accountable uh, is critical. And so customer development uh, was pioneered by a thought leader named Steve Blank, who came out of the military. Uh, he's taught at Columbia. He's taught um, in the Bay Area. And he has kind of really put forth this more rigorous framework um, for approaching entrepreneurship. And so there's three different parts to customer development. Customer discovery, customer validation, and customer creation. Customer discovery, is there a pain out there in the world that is acute enough to build a business around? Very different than customer validation. Is there a solution? Can I develop a solution to map against that pain? And then customer creation, is there an actual business behind my solution? If your solution on the back end takes up too many resources and people wouldn't pay for it, you don't have a business. And so these are kind of important lenses to think about is one, is there a pain in the world because everything's anchored on pain? Two, might I have a solution that can compete in a crowded marketplace? And three, is my cost of goods sold or my unit cost sufficient enough um, to basically cover um, the cost of customer acquisition for the lifetime value of that person. And that is really where um, the magic and impact happens, because that's actually where you can build sustainable models to drive your solution forward. We talk a lot about the problem spectrum, right? So it goes basically from uh, the most risky places to try to start a business. Is somebody aware of the problem? We've all had that friend or that uh, coworker who wasn't even aware that they had an issue. And then it's really hard to convince them to do something new. Because at the end of the day, you're actually trying to introduce something new and change people's behavior. And there's a lot of friction in doing so. So the spectrum goes as followed. Are they aware that they have a problem? Are they hopeful it might be solved? If you're fearful and entrenched, you're not going to adopt new behaviors. Are you actively searching for a solution? Have you hacked your own? Hacking of a solution is a great piece of validation in the problem, that the problem is severe and acute enough to potentially have you build a business around. If somebody's out there duct taping something with Google Docs and kludge you this in a survey monkey form before there's an elegant solution, that's a very good sign that you're on the right track. What's interesting is have they also <coughs> found a solution and are they paying for it? And if somebody has found a solution to their problem and are paying for it, how satisfied are they? Now for that last one is an interesting one. Are they satisfied? If someone today has become aware that they have a problem, they're hopeful that they might solve it, they have found something, they're paying for it, and they're not happy with that solution, that is a very straightforward place for you to differentiate. They already have budget, they have a mindset, they're used to putting their money in this pile to have the solution, they're dissatisfied. So saying, I have a pile over here you could put your money in and I'm gonna make you happy is a lower kind of barrier to entry, a lower friction or change cost 
Um, but you might not have the same ROI and your investors might not have that same return uh, as if you got someone earlier in the spectrum when they've just hacked a solution, um, but there's not other competitors in the market taking money um, to solve it. Um, what's helpful here in this diagram is there's kind of three circles and you're trying to hit the middle of it, right? Is something valuable, usable, or feasible? In other words, you know, this is if you've read or, or seen Simon Sinek and the differentiation between the why, the what, and the how. You know, why is, is something valuable? You know, what's the pain point that it's causing? How severe is it? Usable, do I know what this thing does when I look at it? Is the user experience, are the buttons in a place that's straightforward? And then how, is it feasible? Does this scale? What does it look like on the back end? Are there data models that can support growth and things like that? So at the end of the day, um, when you're starting something new, you're in an environment of extreme uncertainty. And when you're in an environment of extreme uncertainty, um, best practices only get you so far. You actually need to do something. You need to probe. You need to take action so that you can kind of sense and respond and actually probe and put something out there to force um, you know, the return stimulus. And so when you're starting something that is in a very uncertain place, um, you have to get off your butt and do something. What's helpful here are some other frameworks. Um, agile software methodologies are kind of very kind of key to a lot of this. Uh, in that, we see that people are more important than process. Um, how do you actually small batch what you're approaching so that you might work on things independently? If, if one thing fails or if you go down one rabbit hole and it's a dead end, you haven't just wasted this large waterfall project management approach where you can actually start to kind of slice and dice what you're working on into small pieces and honestly potentially surface the riskiest ones first. Because if you build and do all the easy things, get stumped on something hard, you've just kind of wasted all your time leading up to it. Um, a lot of the kind of anchor on this is being iterative instead of controlling. How do you actually build resilient cultures and resilient teams who can go through all of the twists and turns that being an entrepreneur, that launching something innovative and new actually entails, right? So hindsight makes it look like it was you know, a straight path for Pinterest to get to uh, 10 million users faster than any other company in history. Um, what they don't know is that that line in reality was very, very curvy with a lot of places and kind of dips and turns. And so, you know, in hindsight, you might think things were kind of a literal progression, but in reality, things are messy and there's constant kind of learning, adaptation, iteration. And so building resilient teams, which we'll get to in a bit, is key to that. Um, also kind of critical here is the distinction of planning and plans. Um, Eisenhower famously said, um, you know, Plans are bullshit, but planning is everything. The act of getting diverse stakeholders at the same table, kind of focused on the same problem, hashing out from each of their different perspectives what should be done next is absolutely essential. The artifact of the plan that comes out is often out of date as soon as it's written. Lean Startup has also been in vogue. Customer development kind of paved the way for this. Um, what you're doing here is is focused on learning, right? The, the mantra of, of you know, celebrating failure um, kind of takes some of the emphasis off of the learning, which is key here. You fail fast, so it's cheaper to learn. You don't just fail fast to fail and get your failure badge. Um, at the end of the day, outcomes are more important than output. Um, whether your team does eight customer development interviews or 14 or 22 is less important than the actual shared understanding and learning uh, for your team. Um, at the end of the day, you're going towards product market fit, and that is what's really kind of useful about customer development, is as you are kind of launching experiments to validate your idea, customer development is a cheap, lightweight way to get to the next level and plateau of learning to know, should I invest in code? Should I invest in a landing page? But what you're getting towards is product market fit, um, which is basically, is there a pain that is acute enough in the market that maps to a solution that I have a unique chance to provide at scale? Um, you're looking for uh, minimum viable products. What is the absolute smallest thing here? Um, the key word there is viable. It's not minimum or product. Viable means that it actually um, solves the pain of a potential customer in a way that is valuable to them. Uh, and then I threw in a uh, Princess Bride reference of inconceivable. The problem with Lean Startup is that pivot this and MVP that, um, people can be oftentimes dogmatic 
um, and not actually think of why Lean Startup is just one of the tools alongside design thinking, agile methodologies, jobs to be done frameworks, um, to potentially adapt for your specific context. It is not a rigid uh, plan. Um, at the end of the day, what you're trying to do is extremely risky. And that's what we're hoping to give you some tools to unpack and work out. So you can see on this crudely drawn graph, uh, on the bottom axis is time, and time is moving forward. Uh, when you start at the beginning of time, your risk is very high, which is that first line that's sloping downward. Uh, at the start of a project, when time is low, you allow yourself very little investment, which is what the line going from lower uh, left to upper right is. And so as time moves on, you allow yourself to invest more in your business, right? And so you can almost think of risk is going down and uncertainty is going down because learning is growing across time. And as that happens, the fidelity of your experiments, the time and the money that you put into them, you allow yourself to go up. And so as we talk about the solution spectrum of, of greater and greater investments, you can think of it as you know, problem interviews uh, or pitch measure learn, which is cheaper than build measure learn. Um, those are really uh, core to this customer development process. Um, paper prototypes, clickable mocks, concierge, they can kind of be brought in once you learn, because those take more in, uh, kind of investment for your team to put on. And then once you have something into market, there's all sorts of things around continuous delivery, split testing, and optimization. But really today we're focused on the earlier part of this kind of entrepreneurial journey, um, the earlier parts of the solution spectrum. Um, we are looking to learn approaches and get confidence as a team to make better decisions with data. At the end of the day, uh, hopefully you are familiar with the term balanced team. Uh, what this means is that no matter how smart one specific discipline is, a diverse team with different perspectives, skill sets, ages, sexes, um, political persuasions, uh, actually coming together in a space of trust with shared purpose produces the best results. And what does this mean here? We come back to this kind of usable, valuable, feasible uh, kind of framing. And you can see you know, feasible is potentially development or more in the engineering's wheelhouse. You know, design and user experience may kind of anchor more in what it looks like and, and kind of where buttons are and what the experience is. Um, valuable, like why something might be important, uh, could come from a business analyst. It could come from anyone, honestly. But that is typically, I guess, a product owner um, or the founder. But the trick here is to have each of these roles and responsibilities kind of working on the same thing at the same time. Um, which brings us to uh, our instructable today, which is Dirty Research. Thank you for joining us. This is fantastic. All right. It is Halloween, so this is optional. Is that for me or for you? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, but I brought. What does Facebook say? Is it for me or for her? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, maybe it's for the table. I mean, you want to wear? Well, no. So put it on the table. I, I have an, enough of a problem with sweating, adding this much. Uh, <laughs> it's freezing in here. <laughs> it's freezing in here. So I'm on the other side of the camera today. I'm Annie, the producer of the Dot NYC show. And I invited Peter in here because he's an expert on all these things that I know little of. Um, and he offered to help with the show itself, um, using it as a, a prototype. Cool. So yeah. what we're going to talk about is um, how dirty research may help out um, the validation that a new show is something that um, people will want to see, to invest in, and sponsor and support. And so we're going to do that by creating um, a very lightweight uh, canvas and some questions we think are going to be most critical to have answered. Because in every idea, there are assumptions baked in. And as soon as and as cheaply as you can validate those assumptions, um, the more success you may have. Mm. Great. So to repeat, kind of. In customer development, at the end of the day, these are just structured conversations. We want mm -hmm. everyone to participate, so people who are behind the camera, people who are in front of the camera, um, people who are technicians in the back. There's a way to get everyone participating because you never know where the right insights are going to come from. Mm -hmm. The first thing you have to do is define your hypotheses and set goals. Uh, and then you're going to actually have to go out there and talk to humans because practice doesn't make perfect, but it sure as hell helps. Um, there's kind of two thought leaders that I was going to point to, uh, Ash Moria, who wrote a book called Running Lean. Um, and Gift Constable, who I've already mentioned, uh, wrote Talking to Humans. Um, this is kind of a, a pretty sophisticated discipline in the last 
six or eight or ten years. Um, and so it's exciting to kind of bring it to bear uh, in real time yeah. on a program that is not a software product, uh, but happens to touch the ecosystem. So the first thing, so on the left side here, it just kind of gives you a sample <coughs> script and how to approach um, talking to humans. Um, there's welcomes, there's kind of collecting demographics, there's tell your story, um, there's kind of leaning into the problem space. Um, and then what you'll notice here is that it's often um, later on than you might think that you start talking about what you're actually working on. Mm -hmm. Because as we heard before, the problems that people have in their lives are more important than our solutions. And we want to reflect that as we talk to people um, in terms of having most of the conversation anchored on themselves, their habits, the last time they did this. You know, one of the tricks is you never ask someone a would you question. Mm. So you might say, would you buy this healthy meal program if I offered it to you here? Mm -hmm. And somebody would say, oh, yes, of course I would. I want to eat healthy. That would be fantastic. And then you actually ask them about the last time they had behavior. So when's the last time you got a supersized meal at McDonald's? Mm. And they might say, well, <laughs> Never, <no. laughs> last week. Okay. Or you might say, when's the last time you were a vegetarian for a day? Mm -hmm. Right. And so when you're asking people's questions, um, it's much more important to say, Tell me about the last time you did X, uh -huh. and not would you do this. Got it. And so for right now, I'm curious if you can talk to us a bit about the idea you have for your program. Yes. So um, we're launching three spin-off shows, and I'll talk about the one, which is called Ready Demo Launch. That's our working title. Feel free to send us your titles. Um, so it's called Ready Demo Launch, and it's a demo pitch show. And um, this isn't completely random, this shark head for Halloween, because it's sort of like a version of Shark Tank, but a friendlier version where everyone's on the same team, so that instead of um, there being these high stakes of, of getting a deal, you're, um, if you're a new company, a uh, new startup, you're getting advice at a critical stage in the process from a team of esteemed advisors. Cool. And so I'm curious, as I listen to you, there's a couple different um, kind of personas that this mm -hmm. show is going to serve. Mm -hmm. And so one of them, as I heard you, was the audience. So yes. this is a, you. <laughs> this is for you. Um, another was entrepreneurs. Yes. Are you worried about um, your team's motivations or because you pay them, do they have to show up and participate? We don't pay them, <laughs> as you know, because no, um, you weren't paid. No, but um, yeah, the motivation, um, it, it seems that it's exposure, mostly, mm -hmm. and being able to get that meeting, in a way, with getting before the panel of advisors, so the people that you might, might not have time otherwise to give you this kind of advice. Mm -hmm. So that is what I see as the motivation, but I'd be interested to hear from them. So in terms of those advisors, what do you yeah. think their motivations are to participate in this show? This was, yeah, we were talking about this, Jeff and I, about uh, with Don Barber. Um, and the idea is that everyone wants to give back. I mean, I think it might be a similar reason why you're here today um, for free, to donate your time, um, that um, there's this idea that we're all together growing this New York City infrastructure of tech. And mm -hmm. so, um, so people have been very generous with their time. Mm -hmm. Why do you think the audience would want to tune into this? Yeah, so one reason is every day there are at least a handful, but probably a dozen of these kinds of events around the city. And so you can't possibly go to all of them. And so the idea is that we would pick and choose highlights from each of them and bring them into the studio to showcase them. So, so, that, um, so that's hopefully why the audience wants to come, because it's something you'd want to attend and don't have time to. And so that could be either people within the city or outside of the city. Uh, it could be other startups who are looking um, to mm -hmm. see what else is happening, but also to learn from their experiences. It could be investors who are looking to see what's on the horizon or what's happening. Um, mm -hmm. And um, it could be people who are none of the above who are really just curious. But I, again, I'm more interested to hear what what everyone else thinks, but mm -hmm. that, that was our, those were our main assumptions. Now what's interesting yeah. there is, as you talked about the audience, you mentioned uh, investors in deal flow, but it, that wasn't a part potentially of the motivations as you described for the advisors who would be on the show. Can you unpack that a little? Right, so um, 
they not they might not necessarily be companies that they would invest in. It might not necessarily be in their typical portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, that is one possible scenario where um, we would curate shows that are thematic. So mm -hmm. there could be a fashion tech one, and then the panelists would that would be their area that they also invest in. But when we were talking about those motivations and goals. Um, there was on the table an option for um, a cash reward or something like that, but um, in, our, in our experience in the past with school rewards or things like that, um, it sort of muddied the, um, the equation somehow. Mm -hmm. And so somehow uh, we felt it would be stronger to not have a, a reward in that sense. Um, I'm curious who pays for this? Yes, yeah, so are we. <laughs> so, so are we. So would a potential yeah. fourth kind of persona bucket here be sponsors? Yes, or, very good. Okay. This and, is excellent, Peter. And why would sponsors be interested in this? Um, why? Because um, a couple of reasons. Um, there, is, there is a lot being said and done to encourage entrepreneurship in New York City. Um, and so I think that the show highlights that, that fact, that there, there actually is a lot happening in the city. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I don't see a lot of other programming or content that is necessarily doing the same thing. If, so I, what I heard there was um, both kind of building up the entrepreneurial ecosystem in New York and also showcasing what's here. Yes. Do you have a sense, are those equally prioritized or is one kind of more important to sponsors than the other or does it depend on the sponsor? Hmm. Well, we wouldn't be building it up. We'd be showcasing it. But I mm -hmm. think that sponsors who are active in building it up would also be interested in showcasing it, so um, um, yeah, so we um, we had um, Julie Samuels from Tech NYC mm -hmm. on the show in the past, and she so partners expressed, to the call as well. Okay, great. So she expressed some interest in this being a show. Also, mm -hmm. um, then we've talked to um, Andrew at the call, and um, he was mentioning perhaps the Samsungs and Microsofts and Googles <laughs> of the city, um, but we haven't yet started having those conversations. Okay, so what was good about this setup was um, we just exposed a fairly complicated mm. value dynamic. Mm -hmm. You know, so we, we talk a lot about value exchanging, right? So there's the audience, and there are different types of audience. There's investors, there's entrepreneurs themselves, there's people who are just curious, people who are not in New York, people who are in New York but can't get around in real life to all the events around the city. Yeah. Um, amongst entrepreneurs, we haven't even talked about which types of businesses you want to showcase, but there's kind of that exposure, yeah. getting that meeting, maybe even just practicing um, public speaking could be helpful for them. Mm -hmm. For advisors, there's giving back. Maybe it's not in their portfolio, but they're interested. Um, for sponsors, everything from you know people who want to build up or showcase an ecosystem in New York mm -hmm. to corporates who may have their own strategic agenda. Mm -hmm. um, and so what that tells me is there are a lot of different stakeholders mm -hmm. who have potentially a lot of different layers of motivation, um, and sometimes they may be at odds with each other. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of what customer development helps you do, is build empathy with each of these types of stakeholders, because as a business person and as an entrepreneur, um, you have levers that you can work with, right? You have time, you have scope, you have investment and money, and how do you prioritize decision making um, to kind of validate your riskiest assumptions early? Mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. it's uh, important to kind of put all of the different stakeholders um, out on the landscape mm -hmm. um, to kind of actually just get out of your head and externalize what you think each one of them's motivation is. Yeah. Because then you actually need to develop a script and recruit people to talk to in each of these different buckets mm -hmm. to actually learn if you're on the right path. Right. And what's interesting here is that you may prioritize different stakeholders at different times in your business. So for example, Airbnb is a great, uh, a great example. In Airbnb's marketplace, the biggest risk was not, do travelers want a cheaper, more homey and neighborhood feeling uh, experience when they're in a new city? Like, yes. Yep. We've all had issues with hotels, they're yeah. too expensive, they're impersonal. Mm. The risk in Airbnb's model was, 
will strangers open up their home? And that has been validated through couch surfing, and so it's not completely disruptive out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. It just kind of puts a nice design polish on top of a behavior that certain communities were doing, but nothing at the scale of what we've seen. And so as Airbnb was developing their, their marketplace, they were investing much more on the supply side and so they were sending professional photographers around to both build that personal connection with hosts yeah. to get the, you know, and so yeah. um, that just kind of lets you know where, you know, as part of the customer development process, um, you're going to learn kind of, are you understanding people's motivations properly? Mm -hmm. But there's also an old fashioned kind of business sense in terms of saying, which of these people um, are the most critical, mm -hmm. right? And so mm -hmm. you might say, well, sponsors are the most critical because we need money to survive. Mm -hmm. And then we look at this beautiful studio and we're like, well, we can, we can bootstrap something, right? Entrepreneurs, right? If you don't have the right people demoing their products, mm -hmm. maybe all the rest of it falls flat. Mm -hmm. Or maybe if you don't have good advisors, you can't attract entrepreneurs. Like, I don't know. Right. Um, and that's kind of what we're talking about today is kind of how to unpack this idea you have for a new demo pitch show. Mm -hmm. So this part one here is demographic info. The most important part of this is to know how to weight the feedback. And so a lot of demographics you don't have to ask questions upon. Mm -hmm. So people are busy and um, at the same time, people love to feel heard and to feel a part of something. Mm -hmm. And so it's amazing um, how receptive people are to you just interrupting them and saying, do you have 10 minutes of your time? And then they'll usually, if you're good at this or if you're kind of talking about something that people care about, mm -hmm. they'll give you much more time than the 10 minutes you asked for. Um, but in the demographic section, it's basically um, where do they spend their time and money? And like I said, it's much more about um, have you ever or when's the last time than would you tune into this show I have with all these amazing entrepreneurs. Uh -huh, it's more uh -huh. like, tell me about the last time you watched Shark Tank. Uh -huh. Or tell me about the last time you went to an event in New York to learn about the state of your industry. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of trying to understand their digital f familiarity, mm -hmm. you know, what's their homepage, what's their browser, what tools are they using, you know, what, how many tabs do they often have open, mm -hmm. what are the platforms and services they engage with today. Um, and it's just really about kind of helping you gain some confidence um, on, on you know, how much clout you should give the feedback you're hearing. Uh -huh. um, mm -hmm. The second part is the problem interview. So it's really talking about you have these assumptions for value you want to give them, but that value has to map to a problem they have. Mm -hmm. And so it's really before you start talking about what you're doing, you're really kind of talking about um, you know, what keeps you up at night. And so a great tool here is force ranking. You say, I believe that these are the top three problems that you face that relate to this thing that I'm working on mm -hmm. that you may not know much about yet. Mm -hmm. Are these in the right order? What am I missing? Mm -hmm. Right? Because if you just ask people an open-ended thing, um, it may waste their time. Mm -hmm. It's much easier because you have some sense of what you're working on to just kind of lick your finger and say, here's the top three things. And it's really productive then for them to kind of say, oh, with that as the skeleton, let me put some clay to it. Mm -hmm. um, and I talked about that kind of happy dance. Uh, there's consistent and severe problems, and people are currently paying for a solution that they are unhappy with. Um, the interesting part with media today is people are used to getting things for free. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, where your sponsor conversations right. and the pain points and problems they have, yeah. um, you may wait a little more um, than trying to you know, blow it up and try to you know, get crazy growth numbers with 100,000 people tuning in every week. Um, you may have to start with the sponsors because one, it's, it's a little more tangible and real. Sponsors are paid to know their pain problems. Mm -hmm. The average people, you know, it's, did anybody have a pain to say, I needed Pinterest in my life before it emerged? Like, no. But if you're talking to someone at a company, like, they are literally paid a salary to think about problems and pain points. Right. And so that could be a more straightforward place to start. Mm -hmm. um, there's something called uh, the magic wand, which is after they're kind of primed in talking about their problems, you kind of ask them, well, if if there was going to be a new show, what would it look like? Mm -hmm. right? And if, if you kind of look back, it's like we, of course, talking to you, we talked about the audience, the entrepreneurs, the advisors, the sponsors, the different motivations they might have. But none of that has made it into here. Mm -hmm. That has informed who we look for to interview. But we're really not 
bringing up the details of your program until even after this phase. Mm -hmm. And so it can confuse people who think they're kind of meeting with you to give you feedback on this cool new idea, mm -hmm. and you spend the first half of the time just talking about them and their lives. Um, and then you can say, hey, like if you're, if you're going to wave a magic wand, um, what would it look like to, to, for me to develop a program? Um, and it would be interesting uh, to see how much you know, kind of blank canvas of their description maps to what you might want. Mm -hmm. Um, you can even get really into it and, and kind of uh, talk about what would you call it, which can help you with your branding. Right. Uh, you can say, can you draw it for me? Um, and then you present your solution, finally. And I'd say, answer those questions and send them to us right now. <laughs> Please. <laughs> um, with your solution, you actually like present your solution. It could be you just describing your new show. Uh -huh. Or it could be maybe you mocked up a fake home page for this future show that actually has some branding elements. Mm -hmm. um, but really, it's saying, hey, like we've just been talking about your problems, and you waved a magic wand, and now here's my thing. Like, what surprised you? Mm -hmm. Like, what did you expect to see here and not expect to see here? Mm -hmm. Oh, you didn't think that like hardware was going to be a part of this demo show. You thought it was just going to be software experiences. Um, and so that is kind of um, a chance for you to finally get to what you're working on and get tangible um, kind of feedback on that. Mm -hmm. And the final part is called the wrap. Um, this is where you kind of actually find out if you have a customer or you might want to build a business. Mm -hmm. So you actually ask someone, would you pay for this with money or your data? Money. Would you recommend this to friends? And that's kind of getting towards the net promoter score. Mm -hmm. uh, if this were taken away from you, even though it's a hypothetical, it doesn't exist, um, how disappointed would you be from yeah. 1 to 10? And those two things, the net pr uh, promoter score and that kind of if it was taken from you, how disappointed would you be are pretty important numbers. For net promoter score, if you don't have kind of a 9 or a 10, it's really hard to build a business around. Hmm. Um, and then you can kind of, uh, most importantly, ask for referrals to other people mm -hmm. who uh, you might want to interview. Mm -hmm. Because it's actually a pain to... Um, schedule, recruit, and do all these things. And so yeah. if you actually get time with someone to leverage your conversation with them to get a couple more interviews is huge. Mm -hmm. um, so what you're going to do here is decide if you want to continue or to pivot. And so there's uh, something called the Business Model Canvas with Alex Osterwelder um, that is kind of a lightweight way. And some of the questions I asked you at the start here uh, are pulled from the canvas. Mm -hmm. Who are the people you're trying to serve? What are their problems? Mm -hmm. What are your value propositions that map against their problems and motivations? Um, and so to really kind of use a lightweight canvas to actually like put something out there that is not you know, so overdone that you can have five conversations and be like, we were way off base here, let's change course. Mm -hmm. And you haven't just wasted weeks of planning on a traditional business model. Mm -hmm. um, we talk a lot about the user, the buyer, and the decider. So the user <laughs> is the audience, right? The buyer, in, in your case, may be sponsors, mm -hmm. or okay. if you can one day map advertising against your audience. Uh -huh. um, and the decider could be kind of the entrepreneurs and the advisors and your team who are kind of the nuts and bolts kind of decision makers for you know, what product or service you're bringing to the world. Mm -hmm. But what's really tricky, as we've already talked about, is each of those different kind of personas has different pain points, mm -hmm. different motivations, mm -hmm. and kind of different severities uh, within the pain points. And at the end of the day, uh, you kind of yourself are human. And so you have your own biases so. that you're going to bring into yeah. this. And so when we talk about um, pivot, you know, pivot is basically um, taking your learnings and changing direction with one foot still anchored in the past mm -hmm. because you didn't just waste all the time uh, before. You actually had perspective, you have good domain sense, but you're kind of trying to walk that path to success. And as we said, in hindsight, it looks linear, but in reality, it's pretty curvy. And so what we often talk about is pivoting on the people or the problem. Mm -hmm. So for this, you have you know, solutions that you think map to certain people. And mm -hmm. if we had more time, we would actually unpack and, and give names and something much more kind of empathetic hmm. uh, to each of these uh, personas. We need more time. We do need more time. <laughs> um, but what you should do is kind of say, I want to serve entrepreneurs and the curious audience of New York and beyond. Mm -hmm. And you're going to develop programming to map to their pain points, and you're going to be flexible with what this program looks like. It may not be a shark tank. Mm -hmm. Or you're going to say, we have a unique ability here to convene entrepreneurs and advisors, and we're going to be open to the audience. 
Mm -hmm. We're going to stick to our guns on our solution, and we're going to solve this problem of staying current and kind of giving back to the ecosystem. And we don't know who's going to tune in each week. Maybe it goes international. Maybe it goes to an, a group of people who we never thought of at the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, but those are kind of where you kind of can shift. Um, at the end of the day, uh, there is no easy button. There is no kind of right or wrong. That's why mm -hmm. I call this kind of dirty research. Um, doing it is more important than doing it perfectly. Uh -huh. um, and so uh, your mission, if you choose to accept it, is to actually create a light canvas. I'll give you my notes here. Okay. To find uh, four to six humans mm -hmm. in each of these four buckets, mm -hmm. uh, develop a lightweight uh, script of saying, hey, I believe these are your motivations, so what are the top three questions I'd need you to answer um, for me to know if I'm on the right track? Yeah. And then in coffee dates or emailing folk, um, actually uh, reach out and talk to humans and see if your uh, undoubtedly brilliant ideas have legs. All right, thank you. And Thursday, we will try this all out live in front of you, which is exciting and terrifying. And Peter will be here as well. Um, he'll be one of our esteemed panelists. Cool. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, thank I. You. And I'll get to drinking more and more coffee, which <laughs> it seems to be what you do. <laughs> it's uh, the coffee date is huge. You know, Starbucks gift cards, Amazon iTunes gift cards make the world go round. And like I said, find people where they are. You know, if you're developing uh, a solution for moms, going to the library mm -hmm. at book time is mm -hmm. a great place to intercept them. If you're doing something for professionals, Finding people waiting for the subway or the bus is a fantastic time. You find someone in a suit yep. and they're waiting for their bus, of course they want to kill the time and potentially. Um, another important thing is to pair um, as much as possible to go with a colleague, mm -hmm. ideally a colleague who has a different role inside of your uh, either existing company or a hypothetical future one, mm -hmm. and actually doing this together where one person is taking notes mm -hmm. while the other person is engaged in active listening and, and kind of leading the interview, mm -hmm. and then you'll actually flip-flop. Um, because it's really important to kind of minimize that game of telephone mm -hmm. and to actually have people hearing and building empathy and, and, and really getting to feel viscerally the pain points of the people you try to serve um, because that is the magic, mm -hmm. is actually feeling like you understand that person walking in their shoes um, and they're biased, you're biased, we're all biased. Um, but the more perspectives you can bring towards this shared understanding, um, the less risk you have in your entrepreneurial endeavor. Thank you for those many magic wands. <laughs> and um, look forward to seeing you next Thursday and you. Thank you so much. Thank you.